Turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. You're like, what? Wait a minute now. 12 already, right? Um, we're nowhere near 12 yet. So this is a topical thing. I want you to um, uh, understand how this came about. So I talked to Bria, the one that was up here leading, introduced the children to you. She's our children's ministry director. And uh, I said, I want you to look forward to this weekend in your curriculum for children's ministry. What, kind of, what are some of the things that our kids are going to be covering? And one of the things that she said was how to respond to mean people. And, um, and I thought, that is wonderful, and it's practical across the board, and we are going to discuss that this morning. You see that in your bulletin, there in your notes, rather. Uh, there in your notes, it says, I, I put that in there, some, someone once said this, some of the meanest people that you're going to meet are in the church. How do you feel about that? You know, that was said, that was said to a group of seminary students as these men were being trained to step into the ministry and someone told them and he said, hey, um, I just want to let you know some of the meanest people you'll meet were are going to be within the church. And this one that I heard say this said, yeah, right. He was the seminary student, young and yeah, come on, this is the church of the redeemed, Right. Um, how in the world are they going to be the meanest people found in the church? Well, after a number of years in the ministry, he said to himself, yes, that man was right. I have met some of the meanest people within the church, which is a sad thing to say. Would you agree? Absolutely. 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 There's just, the, the reality is whether it's in the church or outside the church, there's just some mean people. Um, I've been that way. You've been that way. We have those moments of being mean towards people. When the flesh rises up, when you allow that to take root, we are all guilty at different moments in our lives of being mean to people. Let's be honest, right? You're not exempt from being mean to somebody else, and you've definitely not been exempt from having mean people affect your life. Just to illustrate the meanness of people in, in kind of a funny way, this, uh, there was this lady that was getting on a bus and she had her child in hand and she was stepping into the bus and the bus driver says, man, you have got to have about the, the, the ugliest baby that I've ever seen. <laughs> hey, let's be honest. Some babies are ugly when they're first born, right? Uh, the, uh, and so the lady, not knowing how to respond, she's like, I don't know what to do about this. She just didn't even know how to respond to that, wasn't quick to uh, uh, the comment. And so she just goes back in the bus, sits down with another lady sitting next to her, seeing her, she's visibly, you know, disturbed. She says, What's wrong? What's going on? She says, yeah, bus driver just told me that I had this just, I mean, said something really mean to me and, and uh, I just don't know what to do about it. And so that lady says, well, you know what? You just need to go up there and give him a piece of your mind. And so she says, yeah, you know what? You're right. And uh, I think I'm going to do that. And so the lady says, here, I'll hold your monkey while you go up and talk to him. <laughs> the reality is there's some mean people. There's some mean people. Will Rogers once said, I never met a man that I didn't like. And my response is, then he hasn't met some of the people I've met, right? Uh, the reality is, is that there are mean people in this world. world. And um, find your place there in Romans chapter 12. And um, you've been up and down this morning. I'm just gonna let you sit right now, okay? Uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. Just follow along with me as I read those few verses. That'll be the text I'm springboarding out of this morning. Romans 12, 17 through 21. It says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him drink, 
For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Four quick relationship principles. Let me open up in a word of prayer as we look at these things this morning. Father, meet us here this morning. Lord, I know we've all, to some degree or another, been guilty of being the mean ones. And Lord, we, I pray, God, that you would give us a heart of, of um, just confession of that and uh, a willingness to repent of those times in our lives. And maybe it's a pattern for some of us. But I pray that you change us. But Lord, for those of us that have been on the receiving side at times, which is probably us all, Lord, uh, let these just four simple things, God, just be... Um, helpful to us as we live and interact with people and um, in a way that pleases you, in a way that's obedient to Scripture. And so um, teach us, God, through your word this morning. Meet us here by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Four quick little relationship principles. Number one. Resist your instinct for revenge. Resist your instinct for revenge. It's instinctive to strike back, right? Um, you ever seen some of those videos where um, someone's just trying to play a prank on somebody and they're around the corner and somebody walks around, someone's coming up and they're like, boo! And they jump out and, and, and scare them and the immediate response is a fist to the face. Have you ever seen those? It's sometimes quite instinctive to strike back to people, whether in physical form or in verbal form. Some instinctive responses are good, right? If you have a rock getting thrown at your face or a baseball is being thrown at your face, it's good to have an instinctive response to put your hand up, right? Or move out of the way or duck because, well, you're protecting yourself. And that's a good response, um, if you know that you're starting to trip over something and you're starting to fall, it's good to have the instinctive response to put your hands out to try to stop you, right? Uh, it's a good thing. But sometimes when it goes with insults or comments that come to us from just mean individuals, whether it be a moment in time or characteristic of these individuals, that the natural fleshly response, as we all know, is to quickly want to retaliate. Whether, again, whether it's in word or in physical response. You ever seen that bumper sticker that says, I don't get mad, I get even. That's really true to explain the attitude, the natural condition of man. That's our natural response. You say this to me, I'm going to beat you with that with the next line. You ever notice those individuals that are really quick with their words? My older son is looking to my younger son right now. Because my youngest is quick with his words, right? <laughs> he knows that. Um, but there is sometimes, some of us are so quick and we react when there's statements like that. You see there in your notes, I referenced Luke chapter 6, verse 31. It says, treat others the same way that you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. The principle there is very simple from our Savior, and it's in the, the very simple statement that, hey, disciples, you need to be different because you are not to be like everyone else. Love those who you are even have an, are, have even have an enemy kind of relationship with you. Love those who love you for what credit is that to you. If you just simply respond with that principle, well, I'll respond with love simply to those that love me back. Well, sure, that's great, but Jesus is saying go the extra mile because you're, that doesn't make you any, any, uh, much of a special person. You're not any different than the rest of society because that's just a natural response in our world. That's a normal fleshly response. You love me, I'll love you back. You don't love me, well, don't count on my love in return. But Jesus says treat others the same way that you want them to treat you. We call this the golden rule, right? 
Oftentimes we turn this around, maybe making it more like the yellow rule, not quite as golden as we want, and we reword it, at least in our mind and practice, treat others the way they treat me, right? Another interesting thought when you think of this subject matter is this little maxim, I put it there in your notes, is that hurt people, guess what? Hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. Oftentimes, we need to consider the source of that anger and that reaction and that retaliation. Sometimes, while you may be on the receiving end of it, you might have just been on the side of a person who is under great distress or they are greatly hurt, and you have just become that sounding board to them. And thus, Jesus' instruction is very simple, is that we are to treat others the same way that we want to be treated. As he says here in Romans 12, 17, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. That's the principle for the believer. Never retaliate, never pay back. Number two, offer peace to your enemies. Offer peace to your enemies. Look at verse 18. I love verse 18. This is one that's often referred to many times when there's conflict in relationship. Sometimes easier to recite than it is to apply. It says very simply, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Here's the interesting thing about this verse, why I like it so much. That little phrase, if possible, you can maybe make a note in the margin of your, body, uh, of your Bible, circle the words, if possible, and literally it means in the Greek, the way it's constructed, as it should be assumed true. This is what we call as a first class condition in the Greek. In other words, the way that Paul is writing this, he's saying, if possible, and it is possible, because who's he writing to? Believers. Those who claim a relationship with Christ. Those who, as we've been studying earlier in the book of Romans, right, in our more recent messages, is that, hey, the old man is gone. You're no longer in Adam because you have died to that old man and you've been made new. That is the framework of the Apostle Paul's mind as he writes these words. And so this is written to the believer, and he says now, if possible, not like, well, it may not be. He says, no, it is. You need to assume that it's true, that it is possible. What is possible? Again, look at verse 18. Since it is true, or since it is possible, so far as it depends upon you, it's the ball's in your court, right? You have the opportunity to give peace. This is in your court. What does he say? What's the instruction? He says, be at peace with all men. Another interesting thing, that little phrase, be at peace, is that a verb in the Greek, and it's in the present active um, construction. And, and what that conveys is that, hey, you always need to have this. You always need to be in pursuit of this peace. And with it being in the active mood, I mean, active voice rather, it has the idea that you are the one that is responsible to bring this about. This, again, like I said, the ball is in your court. Why? Because you've died to the old man. You have been made new. You've been transformed. He's given you everything is possible that you need. So it is possible for you to offer peace. Remember the old Westerns? You know, Western TV shows or movies and, you know, the cowboys and Indians, or should I say Native Americans. And you have that interaction between people and the, the cowboy comes up to the Native American and he comes up to them and, 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 and they're trying to deal with something, a little conflict. And what does the, the Native American do towards the cowboy to exemplify or to show that, hey, are you willing to accept our peace? He offers the peace, what? Pipe, right? Now, I'm not recommending doing that. But it's illustrative of the fact that he, uh, that, that, is a, that individual could offer this peace pipe over and the receiving of that is on the responsibility of, in this case, the cowboy. Are you gonna accept this offer of peace? What's the illustration? Well, what's the instruction that, that Paul brings here in Romans 12, 18? It's so simple. Offer peace to your enemies. 
really to all men. Look at that passage there in Proverbs 16, 7. It says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes his enemies live at peace with them. Notice how Solomon writes and gives that little nugget of wisdom. He says that interaction and that, that peace-producing response and relationship between the two parties is tied to when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord. In other words, there is a pursuit of godly living. There is a concern to honor God in all of his or her actions. It's tied together, right? I put this little phrase there in your notes. You may create enemies because of your position, but you should never create enemies because of your disposition. You may create enemies because of your position, but you should never create enemies because of your disposition. Let me give you an example. Let me explain that. What are some positions that would cause some division between us and others? Maybe our position on, let's say, homosexuality and how God's word declares as to what that what, 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 he, what God's perspective is upon that subject matter. We had have some strong convictions not to be hatred, not, not to be hateful towards individuals in any kind of way because that would be contrary to our instruction. But just because of the position that we would hold, not because of our perspective, but because of God's word, could that create a division amongst relationships? Sure, it could. But even in the midst of that, as that little statement says, but you should never create enemies because of your disposition. In other words, the position might be a dividing line and create a dividing point in which we're gonna say, you know what, we're gonna agree to disagree, disagree in this sense. But my disposition, my character, my attitude, you know, am I I going to be a jerk or am I going to be graceful? Even when there are areas in which we have positions that we may not agree upon, but our disposition needs to be in such a way, I think as Paul would say it here in verse 18, since it is possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That doesn't mean you have to be in agreement on all their positions. Doesn't mean you have to be tolerant for every uh, uh, unbiblical statement and standard that we see in this world. But our disposition should not cause division, right? We can do that within the church. We can say, well, I don't know if I hold to that same position, that, that same view, maybe on a, on a minor issue theologically. What should our view be? Our attitude should be not that our position, uh, our, our position might create a little bit of a division in our agreement place, but our disposition should never cause a place where there is hate, there, there is division because of our attitude and we are unbecoming towards individuals. In other words, again, verse 18, it depends upon you to be at peace with all men. That's easier said than done. Would you agree? So difficult at times. I thought of this morning as I was driving in to the office here, to the church as I was getting, preparing early. Daniel chapter 6, verse 5. I put that quote there. You remember the account with Daniel? Remember, remember the circumstances that happened with Daniel? Remember how you know, he was called alongside amongst a few other men to be kind of the, those that would be right alongside and come and help and aid even in the kingdom. He said, hey, you're gonna have this food. And he says, no, we're gonna eat our own food. Everything was going well for them. But then there were some that were like, we've got to figure out a way how to destroy, how to create some division, how to bring this guy down. Notice this statement in in Daniel chapter 6, verse 5. Then these men said, notice this, they say this about Daniel. We will not find any ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it and against with regard to, uh, to the law of his God. 
What does that tell us about his disposition and his character? It tells us that there is no means in which we can bring accusation to him because of his unbecoming behavior, because of his character, because of his disposition. But if we're going to find something against him, it's going to have to go against what his position is and what his understanding is and his relationship is with his God. And they did. Came down to the point that Daniel would not bow in honor and worship to this statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And that became a dividing point. But it wasn't because of his disposition. That's a noteworthy statement about this man, Daniel. Oh, to be noted and characterized by that. Number three. Get out of God's way. Get out of God's way. Remember, we're dealing with the fact that how do we deal with people who are mean? How do we deal with people who are mean? Number one, resist your instinct for revenge. Don't repay evil for evil. Offer peace to your enemies. Always look for the opportunity to be uh, peaceful towards another individual because that's becoming of our new nature. Number three, Get out of God's way. Look at verse 19 of Romans 12. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. Why? Because God is the one who is responsible for bringing about his vengeance upon people. That's in his court, right? Give God room to deal with people who deal with you harmfully and hatefully. In other words, let God deal with those individuals. I read this story about this pastor, a pastor of this church for some 25 years, and he tells the story that, and he opens up and he basically says, he says, out of the 25 years I've been to the pastor of this particular church, he says 23 of, no, what did he say? 22 of those years have been wonderful. But then you wonder, well, what happened to the other three years? Well, they were a little less than wonderful. He goes on and tells the story of how he came into this church. To, he was, he was uh, brought in to be the, the pastor of this church. It's already an established church. And um, they hired him. And there was a group of people right out of the gate, right out of the beginning, that didn't like this man. Just didn't like him. They had issue with him for various reasons. They just didn't like this man. And so the first three years, as he tells his story, he says that a small group of people, 15 to 20 people or so, gathered together in this church and kind of, uh, kind of just banded together and, and they were trying to figure out ways, how can we take this guy down? They wrote letters to the whole church, spreading lies about this man, even accusing him of having multiple affairs with women accusing him that he has stole money from the church, amongst many other things that they brought accusation against this man, which were all false. And he said it, it, it was so painful that he would at times walk into his house and see his wife in tears because another letter had gone out. It affected his children, affected his wife. It was coming into the home, and it was painful. The pastor recounts of this extremely dark season of his life and his ministry. And, and um, he remembers this time when one of the individuals of this group of 15 to 20 people came to him and called him aside and says, hey, um, hey, you know what? We, we got together. We collected up enough money to cover your salary for a year if you would just resign. Just get out. And he politely looked across the table to that man and he said, God's servant is not for sale. 
And over the years, he can testify that he worked diligently to be grac- gracious to these individuals. He said, and he, and he recounted the situation in his mind in the midst of that dark season that he recounted of what happened with Peter and Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was just about to be arrested. And remember what happens? The, the guards come in to arrest Jesus. What did Peter do? He pulls out his sword, right? He's like, man, I'm going to take this guy down. And he takes this swing at, his, at, the, at this guard and takes off his ear, probably wasn't being aiming at that ear, but he was more of a, Peter was more of a fisherman than a swordsman, and he had a bad shot, right? And he recounts, this pastor recounts that story in his mind, and he says, God just showed something to me in that, in that moment, remembers the words of Jesus in the, midst that mo- in the midst of that moment, and he told Peter, put the sword away. Put the sword away. And it spoke to this pastor in the sense that he said, you know what? Give me room to act. Your role, your response just like Peter's responsibility was in that, in that situation of that conflict between Jesus and those guards, was to stand down, put the sword away, give room for God to do what he wants to do. This, this pastor goes on and explains, well, how did it all shake out? How did it all shake out after those years? Well, you heard at the beginning, he's been a pastor of this church for 25 years, you know, three of them were pretty miserable, and the others have been a place, have been a time of blessing. So how did it shake out with all of those individuals? He says, well, there's been quite a few funerals. And because ultimately, what, what do you think happened? God poured out his vengeance. It's God's responsibility to deal with those that come against God's people. Number two, another thing that took place amongst those people, those small group of those people split off from the church and started another church. And um, for the 20-year existence that that church, that other little spinoff church had from that main church, out of the 20 years of its existence, they've gone through 10 pastors. That's like two every year. That's ridiculous. That's painful. And then others, by God's grace, some have come back and asked for forgiveness. And they're there back in fellowship with that pastor and his church, back where they originally were. Peter writes, 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25, for you have been called for this purpose Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you, what? What's the word there? An example for you to follow in his steps. I looked it up. This is one of the only places you see this phrase, follow in Jesus' steps. And notice the context. He says, who committed no sin, nor is any deceit found in his mouth. And here's the context. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering... He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him. That would be his father, right? He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually strained like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls." Notice the instruction that Peter records. Follow in this example that you would follow in the, in the steps of our Savior. And the context was that of reviling, was that of suffering. That's what our Savior endured. And that is the context when the example was given in which we should follow, not to revile and return and not to retaliate in any way. The same instruction that we find here in the book of Romans chapter 12. Never repay evil for evil. And so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. 
And then here in verse 19 again, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's exactly what our Savior did as well. He entrusted himself to his Father in the midst of the insults, in the midst of the reviling, in the midst of the pressures that were coming against him so that he would be an example for us to follow in his steps. Leave room for God to work. That pastor that I told you about recounts that he said he never once, he never once over that period of time, ever once dealt with it head on in confrontation or dealing with these negative thoughts. He just let it go and let God have the room to work. Good example. Number four, and lastly. By the way, if you don't like this word, it's a little strong. You can change the L's to S's. You'll figure this out. You can kill or kiss. You can kill your enemies with kindness. You can kill your enemies with kindness. Look at verses 20 and 21. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So that's all pretty clear, except for that one little line in there, right? Heap burning coals. Yeah, I want to do that part, right? You're like, yeah, that guy's been a jerk. I want to get the coals and pour it on his head. Well, if you understand what that text really means, culturally, you'll understand that that's not what is implied. It's this. Oftentimes, you remember back in that time, they didn't have you be able to go to your oven in your house and, oh, you know, click, 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 you know, nice little fire. It's all nice and good that you can turn this thing on, get the right temperature just right. What did you have? You had a wood burning stove or a coal burning stove or some type of thing in your house where you could cook. But you also couldn't just run down to Walgreens and grab, you know, oh man, my fire went out. So I'm going to go get a little clicker lighter, right? And uh, some lighter fluid just wasn't around. So what'd you do? You always try to keep your fire hot. You always try to keep the coals burning constantly. And there was times when the coals would go out. So what would you do? You could walk over next door, knock, knock, knock. Excuse me, my, I, I, my coals went cold and uh, I, I, can't, I can't cook my food tonight. Can I, can I get a few of your coals here? By the way, I got my bucket ready. Um, and the idea is, is that, hey, sure, you can take some of my coals and you, you can take them and put them in your bucket so you can take these hot coals back over to your house and so that you can get back to the place where you can provide for your family and cook this meal and you can bless your family. That's the idea. And the context here is that of enemies. It's the idea of blessing. That's the idea. You can kill or kiss, if you like that word better. You can kill your enemies with kindness. Responding in such a way that it's not retaliatory, that's not continuing that pursuit and that attitude, but you change the whole scenario because it is possible to give, offer peace to the individual that is around you. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. I put this little quote in your notes. Becker T. Washington, phenomenal educator many years ago. He says this, I will not allow any man to lower myself to, by hating him. The only way that I can destroy my enemy is to make him my friend. That's good. That's good. Would you agree with me this morning that these principles are helpful that they are healthy, that they are unifying in, in flavor, but would you also agree with the, me this morning that they are, in the flesh, extremely difficult? Would you agree with that? Yeah. Notice I put the little disclaimer there, that they're difficult when we are in 
the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 says, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. That's who we were, right? That was us. That was Chad. That was me. I was alienated. I was hostile in mind, and I was engaged in evil deeds. Yet now, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Christ went to his cross so that you can be reconciled to him, so that you could be presented before the Father as one who is holy and blameless. And we know that positionally that this is true instantaneously upon salvation. You are declared righteous because all of Christ's righteousness is imputed to your account. But even as we've been studying earlier in the book of Romans, there's no, uh, there needs to be the reality that these things positionally come into the practical aspects of our lives. Even when people are jerks. And as I started off, that first thing there in the introduction on the first page of your notes, someone once said, some of the meanest people I've met are in the church. I can attest to that. One, and two reasons. Number one, I've been that person. I've been that person. There's been those moments where I have been that person. But I've also been on the receiving end of that in significant number. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. But in the midst of it, in the reality of it, how do we as followers of Christ respond in these things? How do we do that? In closing, you see there an application. Which of these four principles do you need to implement into your life today? Maybe one of those, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm good with that. Another one, you're like, I stink at that. Who do you need to offer peace to today? Parents, which of these principles do you think you need to emphasize in your home and what is your action plan to make this happen? It's good to know these principles, but it's better to apply. I'm going to have somebody come up. Lindsay, come on up here, Lindsay. In some of our, with baptisms, you know, in the past, we've had some, we baptized some and we've had some share their testimony. And she came up to me, oh, was it last Sunday? I think it was last Sunday after the service, and she was just like bubbling over with joy. And it stuck in my head. And so this week I emailed her and I said, I have this idea. And, uh, and she's like, what? And uh, so I want her to share what God has been doing in her life and have her share her testimony, uh, what God's been doing. So here you go. All right, bear with me. That's a lot of faces. Um, all right. So I grew up in a large Christian family. Um, I always went to church, wore the right clothes, listened to the right music, um, went to church camps, and uh, I had loving parents. Uh, I still do, but um, I never needed anything. And about 12 years old, I decided I was smarter than my parents. And uh, like most of you children out there, and I wanted to live my life my way, which still involved going to church, but it also involved drinking, smoking, swearing, partying, and a lot of drugs. I uh, started skipping school, dating the wrong type of people, and about 15, I ran away to be with a much older guy who physically and mentally abused me. But it was okay because he supplied my fix, what I needed at that time. I started stealing and lying, and I ended up in a very dark place. Even growing up in the church, I ended up in that very dark place because um, I didn't let God do it. <laughs> I, um, 
I didn't get out of God's way at all. And um, by the grace of God, my parents found me after about four months and had me kidnapped um, and sent away to a behavior modification program in the middle of our US of A, <laughs> um, away from everything, away from my fix, away from my friends, my family. And um, so I, I graduated the behavior modification program, which is basically a kid prison, uh, minus juvie. And um, sorry, guys, I'm shaking. <laughs> um, I got to keep, catch up on schoolwork. I got clean. Um, and I graduated the program. I rededicated my life to Christ and got baptized in that state. And I came home. And when I returned, my uh, parents had moved out of the state that they were living in, that we were all living in, because they felt it was best to um, be away from everything I knew. So I returned to a new state, new church, new life, and not long after that, I met my first husband at 17. I was real smart. Um, we dated for about three years, married three months, and I thought I was on God's path. I thought I was on a good path. We were worship leaders in, uh, in our church, and um, I was doing all the right things again, but when my marriage failed, I lost hope, and um, I decided to do it my way again. Uh, once again, I didn't need God's help. I continued to be a casual Christian um, while also living in sin. I immediately fell in love with my second husband, and um, after 14 years, I brought my beautiful son into the world, and um, all while on my own guidance, I wasn't really listening to God. I was there at church about twice a year, Christmas and Easter, and um, my life was still based on me, just me. Um, we moved back to the valley, and I church hopped for a few years. I never read my Bible. I didn't pray on a regular basis, and I definitely did not trust in God to make my decisions. Then about a year and a half ago, I walked into Grace, and I found my church family How convenient for me to walk in to this church that I had gone to as a young kid when Chad and Suzanne were my youth leaders, and I walked in and I saw them. Um, I had a life-altering medical issue about three or four months after starting to go to Grace full-time. And about six months after going to Grace, I, um, I got to go to retreat. Somebody else had, had not gone, so I was able to be gifted um, access to go to uh, that retreat where I decided that um, I needed full time to be in the Lord's word and grow closer to him. Um, so, sorry, I, I was put into a room with other gals that had also been to the same neurologist as me. So it was just every part of this, these god that, um that happened, um, they were there. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so since the retreat this year has been uh, full of clarity and love for God and understanding of his word, services started to just dig deep and gave me a sense of obligation. Honestly, my sense of obedience is incredible to me, especially being a stubborn, strong woman. Um, but just amazing things have happened since retreat that I can't describe. Um, and then also, uh, sorry. Uh, applying what I hear on Sundays and Wednesdays and my devotions, learning to be a good child of God. I have developed not just a love, but 
I became in love with my Lord and Savior, which is just by far what I could have ever, ever dreamed of. I, um, a few weeks ago, um, Pastor Chad was talking about fasting, and I'm, I'm not new to the concept. My grandparents had fasted every Sunday for every time I saw them, and they're in their late 80s, so I knew that that's something that, you know, good, strong Christian people do. And after uh, Chad talked about it, I decided I'd try it. Thank you. So, um, so I did, and on that first day of fasting, I woke up um, loving my ex-husband and his girlfriend, <laughs> and I had been so angry and so frustrated. There was such a deep hurt in my heart, and I woke up loving them as a child of God, not the people that hurt me, because they didn't do it to me, but I, I woke up knowing that it's not my place to be angry. It's not mine. Um, I started being lighter uh, every time I fast, and um, I became a better parent. Um, I listen to my parents and actually appreciate them. Uh, I did before, but not like I do now. I just, I felt lighter. Um, my driving got better. <laughs> I'm, not as, I'm not as angry at all the snowbirds. <laughs> um, my gossiping at work um, went from a little bit of gossip to, oh, ladies, let's just pray for them. <laughs> and um, I just have a calming effect from the things that I do in my life. Um, uh, down to my neighbor, my, my, oh, my evil neighbor. And uh, I got her package last week, and I, I so deeply thought, you know, she has just been rotten for six years. I'm just going to keep it. I should just open this up right quick. But I didn't. I knocked on her door, and it was a teaching moment for my son. And he'll tell you what I said in the car. Uh, it just... It wasn't right. It was just not something we do. So, of course, I knocked on that woman's door, and I gave her the package, and she, was, she had been waiting it for, for, for weeks. And um, so just little things like that, uh, uh, like, like pastor doing um, baptisms today. I thought, oh, you know, I've been there, done that. Lord, I'm not going to go. And then 20 minutes later, I get an email from Pastor Chad. <laughs> to come speak. So just the little things that I started listening to that, that my ears were so deaf to, the things that he's been telling me for years, the things that I should have listened to, and I just, I was so closed off that, that now I have that, that clarity, that moment, um, that beautiful morning when you wake up and you you put on all your armor and you decide this is how each day should be by our Lord so um, I'm sure I have more on here but I lost my spot a long time ago so um, yeah I just I want you guys to know that um, I'm sure it's it's a learning curve for everybody in their own different way but Man, when you just start listening, <laughs> it's incredible the way that you feel about, about your, your God, our God. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's a good testimony, isn't it? I can tell you the, the joy, the bubbling over response that I saw was wonderful. I'm gonna have the band come up and just close us in a song as we end our service. Um, maybe you are here this morning and you're like, I can't respond like I'm supposed to, to, supposed to, be, to my enemies because I don't have what I 
just heard Lindsay talk about. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to Christ. You've done the church thing, but you've never been a surrendered individual to be obedient to Jesus. And let his power live through you. Maybe today's the day that you need to respond for salvation. I just want to invite you. By the way, last week, there was one that came, and the reason they came was to give their life to Jesus last week. So praise God for that. So, um, let God move. Let God have his way in your life. Our attempts in this world are futile. And our reasons and our means of dealing with, with problems are usually mess makers. But if we respond and live in a way that's biblical and submissive to our God, um, doesn't mean life is going to be peachy and easy, but I guarantee you it would be in accordance with the plan and the direction that he wants so that he can be exalted through your life. Let's pray. Father, I pray for anybody that may be here that is holding on to bitterness towards anybody, whether it be within the church, whether it be outside in the community, whether it be within our family relationships. I pray that you would resolve those things. Um, this morning in, in, the, in the hearts and minds of those that are here. They would surrender to you and give you room to work, never taking the place of retaliation, killing the enemy by showing kindness. So Lord, do that work in us, God, so it's not us that's put on display, but it's you. So that others would look around and think, I want that. Thank you for the work that you're doing in Lindsay's life. Thank you, God, that you have taken her on that journey and been able to allow that to be shared this morning, God, to challenge us in being in love with you. So do that in our lives. Pray for anybody here that doesn't know you, God, that you would bring them to yourself this morning. They've never confessed their sin, they've never repented, never turned their life to you, that you would bring that about by the power of your Holy Spirit in their hearts this morning to cause them to surrender to you. We love you.